Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. Um, and I'm pretty cheery today because, drum roll please, dum dum dum, we won! We won! We won big! We won huge! Okay, I'm done. No, I'm not done. But I'm done just screaming about how happy I am. I'm so happy I could just, you know, shed with joy because we won. We won. If you know Hebrew, we're done. We're done with this progressive post-Zionist government, the first Israeli-Palestinian government and the last, God willing, in Israeli history. It's over. And now we have Bibi's back. Bibi is so back. The right wing won 64 to 65 seats in Israel's 120 seat uh, Knesset on Tuesday in the uh, fifth round, so-called, of elections, but it really was just the first election since we uh, had our first Israeli-Palestinian government a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and to discuss this uh, momentous occasion, I could think of nobody better than my old pal and erstwhile blogging or or what is this called, podcasting partner, none other than, drum roll, please, dum 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 Gadi Taub, he back. <laughs> You, you sound like an announcer on UFC. Do you, do you watch UFC? I, like the... I'm sure I do. I'm trying to imitate somebody. I can't figure out who it is. So I'm either doing a good job or making a fool of myself or both, but I couldn't care less. So what do you think of the fact that we won? Um, I, I am uh, exhilarated. I really feel like uh, we're back to normality. You know, the, their slogan was normality. It's exactly like the Biden slogan, right? So they make the craziest things under under the the banner of normality but now it's back to normality in the in the sense that that um there would be a government that takes care of israel's um existential interests rather than trying to please a progressive uh, um, uh, administration in the united states you know it's true I mean, what we just had was a post-nationalist government which wanted to essentially abandon our national character, our national identity to merge into some sort of a gobbledygook of uh, globalism where our foreign policies and a lot of our domestic policies are actually dictated by outside actors, first and foremost, the Biden administration. And we saw this in, you know, a whole host of their policies, um, particularly the foreign policy, but also our policies uh, with regards to the Palestinians. So in regards to Iran, in regards to the Palestinians. And, and um, recently and in the maritime agreement vis-a-vis -vis uh, Lebanon. I, I put that into the Lebanon. I mean, I put Lebanon into the Iran thing, but yeah, you can. We can I just wanted to say before, well. before we, we probably, if, if you want to talk about it, of course we can, but just symbolically look at what happened here. It, Biden dictated a framework and a time frame too. Yair Lapid abided by all the dictates of the White House and then bypassed the Israeli parliament and never submitted it to the Israeli parliament. So it's like he's accountable to Biden, but not to Israel's citizens. It couldn't be more clear. No, you're absolutely right. So let's talk a little bit about what just happened on Tuesday. So we have, uh, we won! Uh, and, then he was, and then he was hung by his own petard, right? I mean, the reason that the right wing won uh, the reason why Netanyahu is making his second comeback after, you know, he made his first one in 2009 when he came back uh, after losing the uh, premiership in the 99 elections to Ehud Barak. And then uh, uh, he, he uh, a decade later, he came back into office. He served for another uh, 10 years um, and then he was ousted by his former aide, Naftali Bennett and the left and the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and the uh, Supreme and, Court and, and the Attorney General. Right, and the Supreme Court and the Attorney General. And now he's back with the most solid, uh, homogenous, uh, right-wing uh, religious coalition he's ever had, where, um, where he has the power, because of the nature of the coalition, to essentially do whatever uh, he wants to, I mean, within bounds in terms of what he pledged to the gov to the people and what the people demand of him. So this is actually a, a, a totally new kettle of fish. How do you, what is your, first of all, how do you explain his win? Let's talk about it in sort of three different ways. Let's talk about it in terms of his campaign, uh, what was new, uh, what was new about the, uh, the left's campaign, 
and um, and then we can go forward. And actually, I guess just two ways, and then we can go forward and thinking yeah, about I, what we want to do, I, what I, I lessons think, learned going forward, maybe. There's there's the substance, and then there's the form. The form is the campaign and its messages. I think that was very bad. I think he won despite a very confused campaign. I think it had too much humor in it. They tried to, they had all these little videos of Netanyahu, you know, uh, knocking on a family's door and saying some little skit, which is the wrong way to sell Netanyahu. Netanyahu is an extremely adept, very uh, well-informed and well-read intellectual. And there's no need to sell him as a clown. It's just not the right thing to do. And, I, and Israel is a pressure cooker. It's not like America. The issues are pressing and existential. And, and I think he won on content and on merit, despite not, not conveying that in his campaign. It's just that people knew and understood. People saw there was a government who was not taking care of our existential interests. Um, that was accountable to, um, you know, Yair Lapid, the caretaker prime minister, is a very uneducated um, um, journalist that never finished his high school studies and has no clue about history or anything. He was quoted, I don't know, this is for English speaker, in English speakers. He was quoted saying that the Israeli had four fathers. Because he heard someone say the Israelis' forefathers, and he and, and he misunderstood the, the the frame. He also thought Copernicus was an ancient. Mean Benjamin Greek. Israeli had forefathers. This is what Yair Lapid said. You didn't hear that. He said Arbat I thought he was talking about forefathers uh, in the Bible and got it confused. No, with, no, no, you know, no, four no, mothers no. And three fathers. No, no, no. I he think said, he did that too. I think he did that too. Maybe he did, but I can tell you for sure what he said about the Israelis. He said the, uh, the Israelis' forefathers said this and this and this because he misunderstood what forefathers in English is. So this is the guy who's running the show and his conception of being a prime minister is celebrity. His, if you look at his Facebook page, the background picture is him kissing up to Biden. And I'm saying kissing up because he's indisposed, like trying to find favor with the big guy, as if I can quote Hunter Biden's uh, famous phrase. Um, and, so, and so he wanted to be accepted by the popular kids. And so he left our allies in the European Union. He turned his back to people like Viktor Orban and to Poland, with whom he had a fight in order to find favor with people like Macron and uh, uh, the, the, the same progressive crowd in, in Germany, in Netherlands and everywhere else, and with the you progressives know, in America. Mean, I, I, can I just interrupt you for a second? Because you're talking about the serious stuff. I think that actually in terms of the campaign, um, I was thinking about this uh, uh, really throughout the campaign, and and then I was struck by the fact that I was right when I was looking at the the reason that the that the right won, that Netanyahu and Lapid wrapped this campaign up, as far as I can tell, in September, uh, because uh, it was in September that the parties had to submit their lists to the central uh, to the central election com uh, committee their their candidates list each party has to submit the list and um netanyahu was able to consolidate the right wing parties there were five of them into four by essentially forcing Bitsalel Smutrich from the religious zionism party and itamar ben gvir from the jewish power party to run together and uh, in in parallel to and by doing that, he prevented any right wing party, any coalition party, uh, from uh, going underneath the four vote threshold. So he did that, and he secured he secured all of the right wing votes. He made sure that none of them would be thrown into the garbage because a, a smaller party wasn't able to get uh, the required uh, uh, three point two five percent of the vote in order to cross into the Knesset. And on the other hand, Lapid totally flunked in that thing. He didn't even try, really. I mean, he he tried to get the head of the Labour Party, Mirav Mikhaeli, and Zahava Galon, uh, the head of the Meretz Party, uh, to agree to merge their, their list so that neither of them would be in any danger of uh, losing votes uh, for the for the bloc. And he failed, and he failed for two reasons. He failed because um, 
he's really, really bad at his job, and they didn't take him seriously, uh, and they didn't accept his authority, particularly Mirab Mikhaeli, who who's passed with uh, Yair Lapid goes back for decades from their time uh, in the as media journalists. together, yeah. and also as actors, I think, and uh, <clears throat> and and uh, so he wasn't able to make her understand and also she was she was she flunked because she didn't realize that she was in danger she was looking at polling data that had her at double digits and she didn't think that there was any danger so he wasn't able to convince her of the danger she wouldn't believe that there was a danger and she refused to run with merits merits was actually apparently according to Zava Golon the head of merits they were willing to run together with the labor party but Yair Lapid flunked in that and then later on, like right at the deadline for submitting the lists, um, the 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 Arabs really shocked everybody when the joint Arab list that was comprised of three parties after the Muslim Brotherhood Party had had quit the list before the 2019 uh, elections, so the or the late yeah the March 2021 elections, sorry, um, the uh, the joint list that was comprised of three parties: the Communist Party, the the Baathist uh, Balad Party, and I don't know the PLO Party uh, uh, Tal of uh, Ahmed Tibi. Uh, they had been running together, and then the uh, and then the Baathist Balad Party, that's sort of controlled by Qatar. Um, they decided that they wanted to run independently. So when those two things happened, you had you had five, you had five, sometimes six, depending on how you look at Lieberman's position in any day of the week, you had five, five and a half parties that were constantly polling right around the threshold. And, you know, as a veteran of the 2019, the April 2019 elections with the new right, where they burned up a uh, uh, hundred and I don't know, 180,000 votes or something like that. And they didn't cross the threshold because they were 1,400 votes shy of crossing the threshold. Um, it, it, you know, it was clear to me that this was a huge problem because we, the, the new right was polling seven, eight, six, very low, you know, very rarely five in all of the polls and it failed to get four. So when you're in the danger zone like that, where you're actually polling for before the election, your chances of not getting through are enormous. And if and if and if none and if one or more of those parties didn't get through, then that was going to be a just as it was for the right wing when the new right and uh, and the Zahut parties both failed to cross the threshold and burned up essentially eight mandates for the right. Um, so Lapid just repeated that this time and he and and so when i saw that merits and labor weren't running together and then i saw the breakup of the joint arab list when when ballad quit it seemed pretty apparent to me that that the you became uncharacteristically the optimistic had risen to nearly a hundred percent you became uncharacteristically optimistic um no, I but, didn't say it. In fact, I didn't. Even, I wouldn't say it out loud. I was too scared. So I, I may have been optimistic, but I wasn't about to tempt fate because, like you were saying, the the stakes were just too high. But I think, you know, looking at this, that was one of the aspects of the of of the campaign that was critical and decisive. And then there was one other aspect of what what Le, what what Netanyahu did, and I'm I'm writing about it now for JNS that I'd like to get your thoughts on, which is the demonization. Right. I mean, you know, Netanyahu in the past, uh, I mean, the left basically uses de demonization here in Europe, in America of the right as its as its main tactic. In fact, its main strategy for for winning elections. You know, you see it in America very clearly ahead of the midterms and before 2020 and before 2016 and before Every single election, the right wing is, is, or the Republicans in America, they're all always, we are always demonized by the left. And I think something changed in the, in the effectiveness of the left's demonization uh, in this election and maybe in general. You, you care to give me your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I, like I say often, the problem is the press. The press has managed to not report any of the important issues. Um, we have a very nice uh, Hebrew word. Maybe you can come up with a, an, an English parallel, le'atreg. It's to treat gently like the etrog that we have 
in uh, Sukkot, um, uh, which is which is held in a very in a box with with straw or something soft around it. And oh, so they yeah, well, it was a styrofoam they, and it's present in aging. Is the trog is a citrus fruit? It looks like a it looks like a lemon, and it has this little little top to it. If you're not familiar with it, it has like this little uh, stem on top, and that's what. Ooh, there's your cat, and that's what one makes it kosher. One of them. And if oh, okay, and if you don't have, if you don't, if if the little stem on top is at all broken. Then, then the then you can't use it for the kosher, for, and you can't for... use it uh, in in rituals in in Sukkot. So, a tro an etrog when you when you buy it, you purchase it in a in a box that's lined with styrofoam or in the past you know straw or whatever to protect it in every direction so that it it won't get any shocks. On the I think we, I think and we can so say kid gloves. They, they, yeah, it's they, not even kid gloves. I mean, kid gloves. No, no, but for the metaphor, in order to say, you're not going to get them too yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. Right. So here, you thought of it, I didn't. So, so the the press here basically, because what happened to the press since Oslo, and and it happened to the press not just here; it's also in other places in the West, in the United States, it's even more pronounced. The press has abandoned its old role in trying to report reality. It changed it to a new mission in trying to educate the public and it's not the same thing because it's seeped into if if your goal is not to describe reality but to change the minds of your audience then you 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 basically give yourself a waiver from the the truth and and you start distorting reality so what they did is they demonized netanyahu to such an extent i had this crazy argument with a i'm, I'm now in a program with a which is left right it's like i don't know uh, uh, crossfire um, and and I tried to get from the leftist guy, I tried to say, to ask him if he has any objections to Netanyahu's policies, and he couldn't tell me what they are. These people yeah, hate Netanyahu. I think Netanyahu. That I talked about you in my podcast last week because I had That's just a good idea always, Gary. Um, well, and you, it's well, amazing. you had a knock out on that one. But yeah, no, I mean, say, so you, you, you retell the story at any rate because As, I made, Yeah, I so, I, so I tried, I tried this to ask him, what is it about Netanyahu's policies that you, that you hate so much? And he said he didn't have any policy. So I asked him, Israel was quite a success story in the last two decades. Did that happen despite Netanyahu or independently of Netanyahu? He said the only policy Netanyahu has is to take care of himself and his family. And it reminded me exactly of what happened to political discourse in America, because I sometimes have um, American politics are also one of my, my interests. And, and I often have conversation with American friends about Trump. And I and I keep asking, what is it about Trump's policy that you didn't like? And they kept saying there is no policy, you know, and there's like the lowbrow, the, the lowbrow low version of it is he's a racist. He's awful. He's that's his character. But I talk to intellectuals and they say, no, there is no policy. Lights have gone out in the State Department. There is no American policy. And it's amazing because there was a brilliant American policy in the Middle East. Netanyahu, along with Trump, Mike Pompeo deserves part of the credit. He was on my podcast where he explained what the American policy here was very clearly and how it led successfully to the Abraham Accords. But you can't get leftists to argue about this because for them, it became a drama of good and evil. It's like orange men bad. It's like Netanyahu is evil. And then, and you can't get over the argument. And what happened is that this hate campaign supposedly was supposed to be buttressed by Netanyahu's trial. And, and, and in Netanyahu's trial, it, it, it emerges ever more clearly with every passing day of the cross examinations that there is nothing that the, that Netanyahu had been framed and so what the press does is not report about cross examinations it's like if you live in Israel it's an amazing phenomenon they report the examination by the prosecution which of course makes it seem like Netanyahu is guilty in bribery and that's nebulous kind of offense that we have here, which is breach of trust, it's called. And 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 then when cross-examination begins, the press just stops reporting about it. And so, Caroline, there was a heroic effort by independent individuals to report what and is going on in the Kowarski trial. He was on the show. Great. So this is the, the what is called the, the 315, 315 Project. 315 Project. 
Yeah, and you probably explain what it is. And then there is Kineret Barashi and the independent studio for covering the, the trial. And then there are I, because, investigative... Uh, just, just, to yeah. get, just to get, you know, Netanyahu tried repeatedly to allow for his trial to be televised, right? And they, of course, refused because they wouldn't want transparency in anything that they've done in relation to framing him. So, uh, so Kinneret Barashi is a defense attorney and, 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 a, and a public figure in Israel. She got together with four or five other people and, uh, and journalist uh, reporter Eli Tsipori, who was one of the first journalists who really was pointing out that the whole bribery concoction that they were building against Netanyahu from, from the very earliest stages made absolutely no sense because he was a telecommu telecommunications reporter, a reporter on the telecom industry for an economic paper called Globes. And so he, he was reporting this almost every day, just how weird it was. And he was on the left that the, that the regulatory allegations against Netanyahu made absolutely no sense uh, from a from a substance perspective, so over time, you know, he became more and more sort of sucked into the vortex of the framing of the prime minister in these charges that made absolutely no sense just from the perspective of the industry. And so, uh, of course, in time, he was forced out of his position because how can you allow somebody to report reality in the media? And uh, at any rate, so he worked with Kinneret and Ellie <clears throat> has actually basically taken up a second residence at the Jerusalem District Court. And he was acting as a stenographer, more or less, for what was going on in the courtroom and sending it to Kinneret. And Kinneret and, and the rest of the team would have every day, I think they're still doing it, have these discussions on Zoom of what it all means and read out the protocols and then and then uh, commentate on them and and yeah so i mean their impact has been has been significant and this is just an independent initiative by by people who just can't believe that we've just been subjected to a legal coup d'etat yeah and and and, and the the parallels with the united states are against striking and this whole legal procedure is actually an info op it's a smear campaign it's not an actual legal uh, uh, procedure Be because what they i think we all should change the way we look at it because we see the the court reporting all those the the, the press reporting all those leaks slavishly instead of being investigative journalists, they just repeat the leaks that they get from the, the established law enforcement and judicial institutions. And so we think of the press as subordinate to law enforcement who are attempting a coup. And that's the wrong way to look at it, as I see it, because what really happened is that the, the aim was to topple Netanyahu like it was to topple Trump, not through the legal procedure. The legal procedure was plan B. Plan A was a smear campaign to hurt them at the polls. And so if you look at it disinterestedly, you see that law enforcement became the investigative arm of journalism. They were working in order to produce, and by the way, timing it to hurt Netanyahu in the elections, like they did. He was in Washington to announce peace accords, and they rushed to submit the indictment so that they can embarrass him when he's standing at the podium with Why Trump. Was at the White House. It was a split yeah. screen. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. Screen. It was one of the most stunning acts of judicial aggression or legal aggression or lawyer's aggression uh, in, in history. And it was really profound and, and horrible and really, really undermined everything that, that he was trying to do. And it wasn't about a peace accord. It was Trump's plan uh, for peace with Israel and the Palestinians that included ah, yeah, Israeli yeah, sovereignty right. over right. over the uh, over the Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria. And the you're Jordan right, and I'm, and I'm glad to have you because you have an an, an astonishing uh, historical memory. I and, and I confuse the two hmm. the two events. And he's here, a what, historian; what's... he knows from what he's talking. <laughs> uh, anyway. I always. I, I had a teacher, a professor of history, who used to say, "I'm a historian. I don't, I don't know dates, because we, we are we are trying, or I'm trying to explain." He, he was a he was a postmodern historian. It doesn't really matter when anything <laughs> happened. What what matters is the Gestalt, and the Gestalt <laughs> is whatever I say it was. And 
Yeah, that's a great well, way of knowing it, history without actually having to know anything. I think that's perfect. It's perfect. It's a perfect. Uh, it's a perfect encapsulation of academia today. Yeah, I won't demonic. defend academia and not even defend myself from your fierce attack. But but what I meant to say is that investigative journalists, journalism doesn't have the means that the state has. And what they did here, and we gradually learned about it, is they extorted they extorted uh, state witnesses by by threatening to 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 demolish their families explicitly threatening to do that and then torturing them in the forms of sleep deprivation and not giving them food preventing them from getting their medicine until they said the right things about Netanyahu and this wore off i think that it the height of it was that was Netanyahu's lowest point in the polls when we had the, the second or the third round of elections and he couldn't cross the the 60 one uh, threshold and 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 but but people got tired of it and started to see through it and now this was if you think of these elections you can think of the population of Israel as a grand jury we just the information was submitted to the voters and they they came back with a not guilty verdict I think you're right, and I think that you know the. Uh, I I don't want to belabor this because I don't want to spend the entire our conversation talking about the trial. But I thought that one aspect that happened last week was really notable, which is that one of the people who was most responsible for uh, sort of conjuring up this info op, and who has a long history of using legal of using law enforcement and the and the judicial and the state prosecution as his sources for his investigative programs. Is is Raviv Drucker? He's a he's a so-called investigative reporter who's really just a left-wing apparatchik who runs an NGO that's funded by the New Israel Fund. I mean, just to give you guys a sense of how how sh shameful it all is. And so he has this so-called investigative reporting program on Channel 13 called The Source. And his last program, I think it was a, a two-part or something like that episode was an interview with uh, one of the key witnesses, uh, Netanyahu's former uh, spokesperson, uh, intimate Nier advisor. Hefez. What? Nir Hefez, What's that? Nier Hefez. Nier Hefez. So Nir Hefez was one of the people that was subjugated, uh, subjected, sorry, to the kind of uh, torturing torture that uh, Gadi was outlining. In fact, that's precisely what happened to him. And he was also put into a jail cell that was filled with fleas uh, to and denied food and and yeah his family was threatened and all kinds of things to force him to cough something anything up on Netanyahu. So on the what was notable was that Hefetz on the stand did nothing. He only helped Netanyahu like every single other prosecution witness. His his testimony was completely worthless from any criminal perspective. He could provide no information that would indicate that Netanyahu had received bribes, thought about getting bribes, had anything to do with his coverage or anything else for that matter that was relevant to the trial. Um, but then Raviv Drucker gave him allegedly, was it $300,000 to uh, come on his show and present taped recordings. I mean, one of the weirdest, most sort of appalling aspects of the whole story with Nir Hefetz is that he was uh, the intimate uh, advisor, not only to Netanyahu, but to his family. So he had very close relations with, with Sarah Netanyahu and I would assume Yair Netanyahu, their son, uh, and, and perhaps Avner Netanyahu, their other son, who was much less involved with the whole uh, operation of, of the Prime Minister's bureau than Sarah, or involved with it, than Sarah and Yair Netanyahu. At any rate, so he was, he, over the course of, I think, the last year that he was working with them, recorded every single conversation that he had with them and stored all of the recordings. And that was why he was considered a gold mine for the uh, state prosecution and the police. And how did they know that he had been all doing all of this? Is because they were illegally wiretapping, apparently, his, his telephone without a court order, because that's just what how they fly. Wiretapping the doesn't doesn't quite doesn't quite capture it. What they're doing, they, they they use cyber weapons. They did the same thing to Carter Page. 
what they're doing is not, it's if people think that they're just eavesdropping to conversation. No, they download all your history. And so they have every single text message or email or picture that you ever sent to anyone. And they can also follow your, your, uh, your surfing history. Right. So they did that not only to Nir Chavetz, they did that apparently to Yair Netanyahu and to their... The, the only thing they're admitting is that they did it to Shlomo Filber, who is also one of the one of the key witnesses who was put under enormous pressure, including a, a threat to indict his son, um, right. which is also reminiscent of what happens in America, because the same thing happened to, to General Michael Flynn. Um, but, but what, uh, Carolyn, if I, if I can let me, let me just, uh, divert from the subject thing, so, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No, but the only thing I wanted to say about Raviv Droger's thing was that, you know, so he gets near Chavetz on and he, and he asks him to give him, um, the recordings of conversations that have absolutely nothing to do with the criminal probes. Just so it was all intimate conversations that he had with Sar Netanyahu about all kinds of things related to the Netanyahu family. Um, to make her and her husband look as bad as possible a week before the elections. And the reason why it was notable is because it showed the true nature of the entire operation against Netanyahu. So we couldn't do anything um, to get him off. You know, we're, we're in trouble because the legal stuff has fallen apart. So now we just want to tell everybody what a terrible person he is. And so that was sort of the, the last minute thing that they tried to do in terms of that. But I think the yes, October just surprise. Go back to the, the demonization that I was talking about, and actually, what I wanted to discuss was yes, the media is uh, an adjunct, or may, sometimes even the leader of the opposition in Israel. They run the campaigns against Netanyahu. They run the campaigns against the left they, of the right. They run the campaigns against right wing policies, reform efforts, the substance, uh, everything that's been done. I mean, uh, the when when Netanyahu sealed the Abraham Accords, they got almost no coverage by the media. And instead, the media pretended that this was terribly corrupt because Netanyahu didn't have a problem with US F-35 sales to the UAE following the deal. And so they were trying to present it to the public as if there was something deeply horrible about Israel allowing its operational partner to receive F-35s. Um, so that they, they opposed the Abraham deals and they tried to present them to the public as something tawdry and corrupt and bad, um, which was which was notable. But um, what I wanted to talk about was that, you know, it, they've been how ineffective they are and why it is that this was ineffective. Because like you said, part of it was that Kinneret Barashi and the 315 Project and uh, and and Channel 14 and you and me and a lot of other people who have been very, very closely covering what happened with Netanyahu and the state of his his uh, his his uh, trial um, exposed that there was nothing. But there are I think that there are other things that have happened over the past uh, year that have also weakened the media's ability to to. Um, Persuade the public uh, that, uh, or or to, or that has undermined the media's credibility with the with the public. And one of the main things that I found is Channel 14 has had a really uh, revolutionary impact on on television. It only launched uh, last uh, December, um, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I think that the most innovative thing that Netanyahu did in his campaign was that he refused to give television interviews to any television station except Channel 14. We have Channel 11, Channel Chapter, Channel 12, Channel 13, and he boycotted all of them. He refused to speak to any of them, and he only gave interviews with chap Channel 14. And they, of course, are have been and remain up in arms against this, and I think he did the same thing with Army Radio. And, uh, and so, you know, these are the arms of the media party. And he and he boycotted them, and I found that to be um, a really innovative and really really notable. So he won this election without having given any interviews to our left wing media, and and that to me is also really significant. 
Yeah, I, I want to, to say one thing about structurally about what happened and compare it to other places, because I think that partly what happened here is happening everywhere. And Israelis didn't stop talking about Ben Gvir, these elections. The opposition, we know why, because they wanted to scare us with a, you, this is the new Kahana, it's the fascists are upon us. Uh, ben Gvir is actually a, very radical. He toned down his rhetoric, but he's a, fair, he's a radical, no doubt. And this is happening all over the West, because when the globalist elites attack the national um, uh, character or the, or the, of the state, or they attack nationalism, the response everywhere is the, the rise of the deep right or the extreme right. And we see it all over Europe while the progressive elites are supporting the, um, the, uh, the EU and its gradual enroachment on the, the sovereignty of nation states. And then what happens is we see the rise of the Swedish Democrats in, in Sweden. We see the rise of Giorgia Maloney in Italy. We see the rise of the Freedom Party in, uh, in, uh, in Austria, we see alternative for Germany. We see this. We see this all over the the West when the well, elites are. You also are... see it with the uh, with the demonization of George W. Bush. I mean, I would argue that Itamar Ben Gvir is really more in parallel with uh, Donald Donald Trump than he is with uh, even you know the AfD, the Alternative for Germany, or the Swedish Democrats. Because, I mean, Netanyahu is not is not a populist. You know, he is sort of a, uh, a garden variety uh, conservative and free market guy. And uh, and they demonize Bush, is that Bush is Hitler. Bush is Hitler but he's, but and Carolyn, Bush is he's really a nationalist. A what they don't what? like is nationalist. What they don't like is nationalist leaders. This is it's always the same. And this is and the attack on Trump and the attack on Netanyahu were both cases of the, uh, their their attempt to intercept a nationalist leader by means other than the polls because they are a minority. But what we see here is a trend to uh, to the rise of deep right parties as a response to post-national elites. I mean, yes, but I just wanted to get back for a second to the alternative uh, press, which I see you didn't want to talk about, because I think that, but I think that it's extremely important because um, the fact that- What do you mean I don't want to talk about it? I raised this You changed the subject immediately. (laughs) And I want to go back to what I want to talk about. It's my show. It's my- Okay, okay. No, the really, (laughs) no, the reason- (laughs) The reason why I think it's it's your show. It's Do whatever show. you want. I don't want to throw you off. I want you to. I wanted you to respond to what I said. So I mean, do you understand what I'm what what I'm trying to get at? Is Absolutely. just that they're not as powerful as they think they are. They think that they're all powerful and they can't stand any competing voices. I mean, I think. I, I think I talked about this last week, but but the the effort to ban Channel 14 and to call that channel election propaganda when all channels 12, 13, and 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 11 put out, you know, for the past 100 years is election propaganda for the left, you know, was stunning, and it just shows that they cannot stand having any competition in the war of ideas. They can't. The Israel, uh, the Israel Ayom Law of 2014 that Lapid put out is the same thing. That the left's whole concept of governing is demonization and silencing. It's and it's, and of course, uh, you know, deplatforming, ousting uh, through through judicial coups or whatever you want to use. But it's, it's all Saul Olinsky. It's all the Saul the Saul Olinsky uh, dictate. Don't attack the issue. Attack the person. And I think that Netanyahu got away from this and was able to win again because he didn't let them. He he didn't he didn't give them anything to work with. You know, I think that if you look at the ads that you said don't make any sense because they're funny and they're they're they make him look like a sweet guy um you know the impact i mean i think i think he's i think he may wrongly think that israelis are too superficial to understand uh the depth of what he's able to accomplish 
Um, and I think that that's a big flaw of his, but I think that, um, then again, you know, um, it works because he's by having these kinds of ads and this isn't the first campaign that he's used them in where he's sweet and he's nice and he's very personable, um, is that he's trying to show that the demonization of him that the left has done is a total lie. And so I think that in a way that is his indirect response to the demonization is making people love him. Um, so, but I think that the fact that he has made a uh, strategic use of channel 14 and of the, and of, and of Galay Israel radio um, during this campaign and the Haredi and the other religious press uh, and ignored completely the left-wing press and treated it as such, not as uh, the mainstream media, but as the left-wing media, I think I think that that also had an effect because it reinforced it gave the his silence on those shows constantly reinforced his critique of those of those media organs. They couldn't deny the fact that he was boycotting them and then anybody watching them had to ask why is he boycotting them and then that reinforced the understanding that there was something fundamentally distorted about the way that 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 they cover the news. Maybe I think I'm there reading is, too much into it, but that's my that's my analysis. No, I, I don't think you are, but I think there is also a cycle. People get tired from the the the, the same uh, mantras of demonization, and and then they see the person behind them, and in the end, they started they start thinking of him as a victim. First, they they buy some of the propaganda, and then they see it's not as bad as the propaganda says, and then some of them at least begin to see Netanyahu as a victim, and that was also built in because the left has been the hegemonic party in culture all along, and in the press, and in the judicial system, and and they've demonized the the right ever since it. It, it it began since Jabotinsky. They've been they've been calling him Hitler, and then they they called uh, Begin a fascist, and then and now they call Netanyahu a fascist. And so this is this is this is uh, this is a, a a line with a limited uh, lifespan. But I think also that the, that there is a look. The whole the whole Netanyahu trial began with what? With Netanyahu's attempt to open the. The, the media market to pluralism. And that is the thing that they cannot stand. You know, Nahum Barnea, who, who got the Israel Prize, I think, for journalism, ridiculously, uh, recently, recently uh, supports the, uh, the censoring of social media. And, it is, and, and his complaint about social media is, listen to this, truth has lost its monopoly. By which he means, I have lost my monopoly. He works for the largest newspaper in Israel, and what he doesn't like, language. and what he doesn't like is that anyone can challenge him. And we see this everywhere. The whole, you know, the press was caught with its pants down, as we say in Israel. I don't know if that's an English impression. Uh, on the eve of the election, when it suppressed the Biden, the Hunter Biden story, under the pretext of it being disinformation. So. They call the other guy's point of view disinformation, and then they imposed their lies as mandated truth. But it didn't completely work. And, and what we on the right managed to do, you have a podcast, I have a podcast, um, Kineret Barashi, we talked about in the open studio, uh, Channel 14, um, even just WhatsApp, WhatsApp. As you say, we Israelis say, "What's up?" Um, uh, we found other ways to to convey information and created networks, and we developed something like uh, the 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 cynicism toward established media that you found in the late days of communism. You know, communists used to, to say, "Pravda net, net investia and investia net pravda." There, there were two news organs of the Communist Party in, in Russia. One was called the truth and one was called the news. And Russians used to say cynically, there is no truth in the news and there is no news in the truth. So so we, we all developed the same attitude and started hunting for the truth ourselves. And so this had a, a, a major impact. But I, again, Caroline, the main, 
what we have is a war between a post-nationalist, ultra-liberal, progressive elite and a traditional and deeply democratic um, uh, national uh, camp or national uh, citizenry. And they are the... minority and we are the majority so the so what we had in this government is not just an attempt to suppress because channel for the 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 the, the caretaker prime minister mr yai lapid tried to close channel 14 um because he said this was this was political propaganda by which he meant he didn't they they they, they actually satirized him very very poignantly um so so they they are trying to prevent pluralism in the press they have run roughshod over democracy they what they did is I, I think for American audiences this is unthinkable they pushed the opposition out of the Knesset committees imagine that uh, imagine a, well, a January 6 Commission that. yeah that was just exactly. what I was going to say imagine that that the the, 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 the the ruling party is pushing out the opposition out of the committees that's what they did. And, and so and that is why they're demonizing us as fascists. What they are doing is acting like, I don't know, fascists, but dictators. And Yair Lapid has a party in which there are no primaries. And it was really funny when one of his, <laughs> one of his lieutenants, they're all, they're, because, because his party is a little dictatorship, he can fire people. So, so he has a whole, a whole section of the Knesset is just subordinate to one person. They're not independent legislators. Legislators, they're not elected themselves to their seats he chooses them and he's their well, let dictator. me just say let me just say two things yeah. about this one is that um you know why don't you why don't you talk about the the extraordinary uh admiration that that you hold for our first female idf major general orna barbie by who is a minister in the outgoing government And one of uh, Yesha Teed leader Yair Lapid's uh, uh, most important uh, uh, compatriots in his party. What did she have to say about Yair Lapid? Do you remember? No, I don't. Oh, she said that there's one God and there's one Yair Lapid, right? I in mean, which, that... did she say it in this order or who's first? Yeah, she said, it, no, she said, אחד אלוהינו ואחד יאיר לפיד שלנו, או משהו כזה. She said something like that, that she said that she compared יאיר לפיד to God. And so let was, me point out that she, that she, she gave God, to, right? she gave God the, the advantage by putting him first. That's, that's not, that's not something we should ignore. But what, what Ram Ben Barak said is that, you know, and this is, you know, in the Likud, there are primaries and, there, and this is the eve of the election. And what does he have to say? He said, Hitler was also elected democratically. And the first thing he did was cancel the courts and then pass all his legislation, which is, It, which is what is the comparison so Netanyahu because he's a Democrat is Hitler right because because he's going to be elected democratically secondly he doesn't know anything about history so the courts in 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 Ger Nazi Germany supported the racial legislation and Hitler didn't cancel the courts he canceled the Parliament after it was allegedly burned by a communist and and why are you making these comparisons and At one moment after Yair Lapid says that he's not going to, to consult the parliament, the Knesset, because the opposition is irresponsible. It's, it's like, don't get into this comparison. You're walking into a trap, you idiots. Except that they're used to something. They're used to a situation where nobody questions what they say, and they're able to get away with the most preposterous lies and the preposterous statements uh, in the entire world, and they'll never be called to account for them. And that's why, you know, they're, they think that they can make these statements. Same with Nahum Barnea and Yediot. I mean, he, he has written some of the most outrageous incitement and demonization of, uh, of, of his political opponents on the right and, and, in, and in Orthodox communities and, uh, in Israel for the, throughout his entire long career as a propagandist posing as a reporter. And... You know what what he took issue with was was the very notion the revolutionary concept that somebody might have an opinion of this and actually voice it and be heard you know and that's the problem that they have 
with the media. And, and to a large degree, you know, they're successful. They change the editorial position of Israel Hayom, right? I mean, it's no longer a right-wing paper. It is an institutional paper that will not voice any significant criticism or expose in any significant way any of the lies of the left or the legal fraternities uh, ouster uh, through judicial and legal uh, coup of a sitting prime minister. So, you know, this is this is something that they were able to do. They were able to bring an ostensibly uh, right wing paper to its knees um, through their intimidation and demonization. And, you know, so they have had an, ex, uh, an ex, and they didn't, you know, to a certain degree, they did the same thing with Macquarie Shon by saying that the editor of Macquarie Shon, Chagai Segal, is, an, is a terrorist. So, you know, I mean, they, they know which button, buttons to press, you know, and they look for those buttons to press, just as they did with Nir Chepetz, just as they did with Momu Filber, just as they did with all the state witnesses against Netanyahu or attempts to make state witnesses against Netanyahu. Uh, they look for everybody's weak point to try to force them, to cow them, to, to, to make them bow and shut up. I mean, the main thing is shutting up. So that's why I feel like Netanyahu's decision not to give interviews to any of these television stations was so revolutionary. You know, that I mean, we, we, I had been, you know, writing about this for years and years and years in various forms. The governments uh, under Netanyahu, under everybody, their subservience to anti-Israel uh, media outlets abroad. And, you know, one of the most infamous examples that I've called, harkened back to time after time was in 2002, when Israel uh, seized Arafat's headquarters in Operation Defensive Shield, when we, the, you know, after we finally uh, counter-assaulted the Palestinian terror complex in Judea and Samaria, um, they seized all of these documents that showed uh, Net, uh, Arafat's direct involvement and leadership of the terror war uh, that, that the Palestinian terror groups were conducting against Israel. And it was a treasure trove of documents. And rather than give it to, say, the Wall Street Journal or even to the Jerusalem Post to give it to a pro-Israel or at least not antagonistic towards Israel uh, media organ, the IDF gave the entire thing exclusively to the New York Times. And then the New York Times promptly buried the story on like page A17, you know, and, and so they hid all of this information and maintained their, their campaign of demonizing Israel. And, you know, the constant belief that you can appease critics, you can prove them wrong and they'll care about the truth once it's presented to them, you know, it has been an animated animating characteristic of Israelis towards the outside world and towards the Israeli right towards the uh, in in terms of the Israeli left throughout the the last decades and so you know Netanyahu's decision in this campaign not to talk to them was sort of I mean for me it was like finally you know finally you get that if you want them to stop being so antagonistic then you have to stop caring that they're antagonistic and, you know, I don't know that they're going to be less antagonistic as a consequence, but they're less powerful as a consequence. I also boycotted them. I didn't see that it impressed you as much. Why not? Well, I boycott them, too, because, you know, we're we're the pioneers. We go ahead of everybody and we're like Johnny Appleseed and we drop our little our little our little seeds and and we plant them and then when people see the no, forest, you're exaggerating we, you're exaggerating so i just follow you so carefully cultivated all these long years they come and they eat our apples and, and yeah that's that's why i just but follow you're right, you so I, you're, so wherever you go just don't jump off a cliff because it will kill me too <laughs> oh you're following me yeah yeah oh okay <laughs> Because I so tried to get care, into Carolyn, about this do? situation, and you wanted to go back to talking about you know something else, so you weren't really following. You're not a very good follower. But no, anyway, I promise to improve. We have, we have six, we have six, we have six more minutes. So why don't we devote them for to to what what we can expect from this government going forward? Um, you 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 give me your thoughts. First of all, um, it is crucial that we have more than a 62 majority. So the counting is not over yet. By the time this is up, we will probably know that Meretz is out. This is what it 
seems like now. The polls, by the way, predicted a tie between the two blocks, the Jewish block and the globalist block. And, and, and they, they fail to see the advantage that we have. But we need more than a margin of two, because as we know, and in this program, I haven't tired of saying it, and neither have you, the, the, we have a very politicized law enforcement agency. The Attorney General Office is extremely politicized, and you can be sure as rain that if this coalition depends on a one-person majority, they will find right the one now person. Right it's at 65% with uh, 94%. 65 uh, seats. 65, 65. 65 to... 65 to 50 for the current coalition, and then the Arabs are the extra five, which are part of the coalition, but it's 65-55 split with the Arabs. Yeah, so so um, we need that margin if we want to do anything to change the structural problem that we have in Israel is that, that, that is judicial supremacy. It's We play politics in the parliament, and then there is an authority over the elected branches of government, which can void their decision. So I I am hoping that despite the fact that Netanyahu is now standing trial, that we, we that this coalition will have the balls to actually make, I don't think they should touch anything that has to do with the trial. The trial must go on. It's actually a good thing because it exposes the way they are framing people. So I actually want it to go on, but some structural changes that will begin to shift power back to our elected institutions. That's that's one of the main things we should do. The other, this is internally. The, externally, we should, we should uh, go back to fighting Iran in an effective way that is not being sock puppets for the Biden administration that is pro-Iranian. We should get this into our heads. And, and, and there are many ways that Israel can maneuver without being of a South state. We are just approaching an election in the United States where, where the, the Republicans are poised to take the House and I, hopefully the Senate too. And then we can work effectively to limit the pro-Iranian um, policy of the Biden administration. I agree. I, I want to add just two things to both of those. One is that the legal reform, I believe, and I'll be writing about this in JNS. You can get more information on it at the website and also on my website, carolynglick.com. But the um, the it, it, time is of the essence. I think that the faster, regardless of how large the coalition is, I think the faster that they can do the kind of significant institutional reform we need uh, to put checks and balances on our legal fraternity, the better, because the longer they wait, the less they'll be able to do, because you get the other side is going to get organized, they're going to catch their breath from their stunning loss, and they're going to uh, do everything that they can to stop. And the other thing is that you want to do as many reforms uh, simultaneously as you possibly can, because the court will probably try to block a number of them. So if you're able to put forward, you know, 15 different actions at once and they, you know, they try to push away three, then you're going to get 12 that through. And so that's, that's one aspect of it. And then the other, just uh, to reinforce what you're saying about Iran, um, Iran is in the throes of a revolution. We've talked about this before on this show, and we'll talk about it again and again and again. This is a revolution, what we're seeing on the streets in Iran. I just saw a report this morning, Moti Kedar put it out, that and, and this is anticipated, is that the, in, uh, I, I, let me just see whether I can find it, um, the Revolutionary Guard is in a pitched battle with the military of Iran um here it's in uh ben it's um in shiraz uh that uh that the uh the the which i think is north of tehran but i have to look at the map um it's a major city and the revolutionary guard are now in a shooting battle with the iranian military because the iranian military uh refuses to uh put down the revolution and in i've seen dozens of reports of Iranian military forces and officers deserting the ranks and moving to the revolutionary side and protecting revolutionaries, opening up military bases to them in several cities. I've already seen two or three reports 
of two different military units that deserted en masse together and uh, joined the revolutionaries. So the Revolutionary Guard is fighting the Iranian army. This is becoming a civil war uh, to bring down the regime. And I think that the most urgent thing that the Netanyahu can, government can do is help the Iranian revolutionaries in any way that anybody can think of because um, their fight very much is ours. Mike Doran has a very frightening piece up on Tablet Magazine about Iran's uh, precision missiles and their drones and how they put together a really um, brilliant uh, doctrine for using them in cataclysmic ways that can overwhelm Israel, that can overwhelm all of the uh, Arab nations of the Middle East. Um, and we don't have a suitable response with our, our missile defenses because it's just, they overwhelm our defenses, even our defenses. So, you know, we have to bring down this regime. Um, and here are the Iranian people asking us to help them to do that. And I think it's both our, our moral duty and, and our strategic imperative to stand with them. So those are- It's our moral duty not, not to do what to. Obama did in the in in the la the last time that they they and what the, the Biden administration is doing is now, doing now. Talking yeah, about, yeah. out of both sides of their mouth just as Obama did you know they they're meeting with Iranians uh but they're empowering the regime uh, uh cronies in Washington their lobbyists and they continue to maintain their slavish devotion to the nuclear deal. They refuse to walk away from it. They want to restart negotiations uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and they don't care that they're planning on giving hundreds of billions of dollars automatically to the Iranian Revolutionary Guards that are now killing not only the Iranian people, but the Iranian military that stands with them. This is the best chance that we've had since 79 to bring down this regime. <laughs> and the Americans aren't helping. Um, so Israel has to step in and, and do everything we can together with the Saudis, together with the UAEs, together with all right thinking people in the world to, to bring down this regime. And thank God, thank God, we're going to end where we started, right? Gadi, thank God we have a Zionist party, a Zionist government back in charge in Israel, or we're about to get them back in charge in Israel, and we'll have a government worthy of our people, right? Yeah, and hopefully we will see this happening in other places, first and foremost in the midterm elections in the United States. Amen. Amen. And by the way, guys, I'm going to be in the States next week. I have a conference that I'm going to uh, in Phoenix, and I'll be, uh, hopefully I'll be able to schedule a, a program from there. If not, um, then I'll miss next week and come back and tell you all about it. But uh, I'll try very hard to uh, have a, a thing for you next week. So that's it, or the week after, maybe next week, I am going to be able to tape show. I can't remember. Anyway, whatever the case may be, uh, I'll see you later. And thanks, Gadi, for joining me today. Um, Always yeah, we a won. pleasure. We won. Big time, we, we won. The Jews won. Yay. The good guys won. Yay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for much. having me, Carlin. Oh, my pleasure.